Hello and welcome to everybody to this joint webinar, which is an initiative of the Acute Leukemia Advocates Network and the CLL Advocates Network. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Zach Pemberton-Whiteley. I'm chair of the Acute Leukemia Advocates Network. I'm delighted to be co-chairing this webinar alongside Pierre Ormont from France, who is the vice chair of the CLL Advocates Network. Um, delighted to have so many of you with us here on Zoom and also on Facebook. I'll cover a couple of matters of housekeeping at the start and then I'll hand over to Pierre who's going to introduce all of our speakers. Um, so a couple of housekeeping notes. You will be all uh, muted throughout because we've got quite a lot of people joining us but if you want to ask a question please do th so either through the Q&A or the chat. We've had a lot of questions in advance of the webinar so we're going to try and cover some of these um, as well. But you're welcome and we really encourage you to ask questions um, as much as you want throughout. It's intended to be interactive. So post them in the Q&A and chat and we'll ask all of those really difficult questions to our expert speakers. Um, the webinar is being recorded here on Zoom, but also broadcast live through Facebook. So if anybody has to drop out or wants to share any of the information with colleagues, you can do so. Um, at a future time. So looking forward to a really exciting discussion and I'll hand over to Pierre. Thank you, Zach. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending this uh, webinar. I think the topic is quite interesting. Uh, the long-lasting uh, pandemic, uh, the treatments, uh, the specificities of the CLL patients, and of course, uh, the vaccines are uh, at the top of the news now. Uh, so we have invited uh, four speakers two clinicians, one regulator uh, representative, and one epidemiologist. And I have the pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Florence Simbalista from France. Uh, she is our uh, CLL expert today. She is well known uh, in France uh, and a specialist of this uh, disease and uh, uh, also active uh, worldwide. Professor Simbalista is head of the hematology biology department at Avicenne Hospital, that's near Paris. Our acute leukemia expert, Dr. Amit Patel from the UK, is the first person in the UK qualified in stem cell transplantation and cellular therapy and intensive care medicine. He is the lead clinician for hematology and transplant research at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, Dr. Giulio Delgado is originally from Spain, where he works at the Department of Hematology of the Hospital Clinic in Barcelona. In his role as second national expert at EMAS uh, Oncology Office, he is currently based in the Netherlands and is joining us today to give the regulator's perspective. Professor Uwe Gert Liebert is a German virologist and a retired professor since end of 2020. He was a director of the Institute of Virology at Leipzig University Clinic and uh, he's a highly respected and uh, expert. So I thank you very much all uh, speakers uh, and welcome you very warmly. And now give the floor for her presentation to Professor Florence Simbalista. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so I'll put my slides on. Is that okay? Okay, so um, I'll try to be brief because uh, I have quite a few slides, but uh, I thought that you might share them, yes, later, so people can have a look at them. So uh, I'll go uh, You are very welcome to ask um, any questions. So first we'll see uh, COVID and uh, CLL, and then uh, we have a word about uh, uh, mRNA vaccine, and then uh, how uh, uh, we're going to uh, manage. So first, um, regarding uh, COVID-19, uh, there was a European study studying uh, uh, the epidemic wave and uh, the uh, conducted by the ERIC and mostly in Italy and Spain around 190 patients 
And uh, what we can say is that considering the median age of 72, and uh, that the fact that most of the patients were comorbid, uh, the high mortality rate among the hospitalized patients was kind of expected, but uh, it seemed to be higher still to the one that was reported in the general population, but I'm not sure that the 13.4% uh, were really related to the 72 years old. So uh, there was a short report from the German group about six patients who were receiving venetoclax and two of them were, were admitted in ICU and, uh, and died. Uh, there is also an American study of about the same number of patients, 198. And what's interesting in that study is that they have uh, the, the similar rate uh, of uh, mortality, but uh, it seemed that receiving a BTK inhibitor for CLL at COVID-19 diagnosis, uh, severe enough to require hospitalization, did not influence this mortality, and it was the same among the watch and wait and the treated patients. So uh, we have conducted a study in France as well. It's unpublished data. But what's important in the two studies that I presented is that they were mostly focused on hospitalized patients. And uh, all the patients who did well at home, and even the ones that were, um, that were asymptomatic, uh, are not uh, considered. So in the French cohort, we observe a similarly high mortality rate of hospitalized patients, but we also had a lot of patients who were treated at home and uh, even asymptomatic patients, even among elderly patients. But what was obvious is that the risk factors, age, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, that were identified as a non-CLA population had exactly the same importance in CLL. Uh, COVID-19 treatment was exactly the same for CLL and non-CLL patients. And what's interesting is there were two trials during the epidemic wave, one with ibrutinib and the other with acalabrutinib, that had been proposed to non-CLL patients to contain the cytokine storm. It doesn't seem that it was beneficial, but it was not detrimental. So what about the CLL treatment during COVID? Well, there is now, I think, a quite strong consensus among the recommendations from the various national groups. Uh, the treatment, if it's ongoing, should not be discontinued outside of very severe infection in ICU where uh, it might be necessary. For the patients in need of treatment for CLL, it is recommended if it's possible to postpone the initiation, if possible, until after vaccination. When the treatment cannot be further deferred, well, uh, we have been giving uh, preference to uh, systemic therapy requiring fewer visits uh, during the waves, uh, during the epidemic waves. And uh, I think that there is a consensus to uh, try to use a less immune suppressive uh, therapy. And uh, we have limited the anti-CD20 infusion. And in France, where we still use quite a lot of chemoimmunotherapy in frontline, uh, it has been replaced by a routine during the waves. We also try to limit the routine lab samples. And uh, for the patients who are receiving uh, immunoglobulin supplementation, the IV route has been replaced by sub-Q. Uh, but uh, we have been also cautious to maintain the vaccination programs, again, influenza and pneumococcus. So the results of vaccine trials outside of CLL, uh, I'm not going to go through it, but what's important to uh, see is that overall mRNA-based vaccines have shown over 90% protection from COVID-19 disease with a very good tolerance. It's not so high uh, for an adenovinal viral vector-based vaccine, uh, but it's still quite good. So, What do we know so far? Patients, I would say absolutely nothing. Uh, but uh, we 
can we extrapolate for some of the work that have been done with other vaccines? Well, there are very few data uh, on vaccine efficacy in patients with CLL, but there is enough evidence also through real life to support in anti-infective vaccination in patient, patient with CLL, because even if there are suboptimal responses uh, that have been shown in, in some trials, it reduces hospitalization rates and it prevents serious disease complications and that's exactly what we want in COVID-19. So which vaccine? Well, considering the recent recommendation of several European countries to use AstraZeneca only for younger patients, it seems reasonable anyway to prioritize mRNA vaccines. So what are the various vaccines? Well, you have the Moderna and the Pfizer that have been approved that are mRNA coding. Uh, and uh, the viral vector uh, is the AstraZeneca, and currently we don't have any approved recombinant protein. So briefly, how the mRNA vaccine works have been uh, uh, using uh, uh, these uh, cartoon from the New York Times, because I think it's quite easy to understand. I mean, the, the mRNA that is injected is, uh, is wrapped in lipid nanoparticles that allows it to enter the cell easily. So it enters the cells at the, uh, uh, at the site of injection and the cells uptake uh, this, the, the mRNA and translate it immediately in a spike protein. This spike protein is expressed at the surface of the cell and uh, here, and uh, you see here that uh, as soon as the cell is uh, uh, dies, uh, which happens regularly because they are replaced, I mean, uh, there is an antigen presenting cell like a macrophage that uh, uh, digests uh, the spike and re-express and presents a fragment that is able to be recognized by a immune cell that is a, a T lymphocyte, a helper T lymphocyte. And this helper T lymphocyte is very important for the activation of the B lymphocyte, which in turn will be able to secrete antibodies against the spike protein. So how the spreading of the virus is stopped? Well, we always talk about the antibodies uh, attacking the virus, but there's also another way. There are the killer T cells that seek out and destroy any coronavirus infected cells. You see here the killer T cell. So what are the typical immune challenges that CLL patients are facing for this vaccination? Well, there are a reduced number of normal B cells because they are replaced by uh, the uh, clonal lymphocyte of the CLL. And also we know from previous study that there is a not so good B and T cell cooperation that is needed here to activate the B cell. And if there is previous treatment, the helper T cell numbers might be affected as well. So there are different levels of problems. What have, you, have we seen from studies in other vaccine? Well, protective effects are reduced in CLL-treated patients, but the three recent studies that I have found in, uh, um, in, uh, in PubMed uh, are uh, conducted on quite a small number of patients each, around 30 patients, and uh, uh, there are some discrepant results on the VZV vaccine, and uh, uh, exploration of the response is limited to antibody pro production, and I don't think that's the whole story. So can we extrapolate these results? Uh, of mRNA SARS-CoV-2 vaccination from works done in other vaccines in a certain way because uh, they are not live vaccines and it's conceivable that the safety might be similar and also the efficacy. And uh, so we may expect a reduced efficacy of the mRNA vaccine, notably in the patients who are on therapy, but um, Concerning the safety, there has been mRNA-based vaccine uh, against some cancer like uh, melanoma for the past 10 years, and they have not raised specific safety uh, reassured. Well, on another hand, we cannot extrapolate, uh, but because it's not the same mechanism, but uh, there is hope, I would say, that mRNA vaccines might work better than traditional vaccines. 
First, they are promising preliminary data in non CLF patients that are extremely good. The studies so far have focused on B cell responses, but uh, it's obvious that T cell immunity is likely to play an important role in vaccine efficacy as well. And there might be an advantage, but that's very theoretical, uh, of mRNA vaccines as the protein processing may allow better recognition by the patient immune system. So, what are the recommendations for vaccination? Who should get the vaccination? I think that we all, physicians, we all agree that all CLA patients should get the vaccination. And in high priority for the patients with ongoing treatment and the patients who had previous COVID infection, they may be vaccinated, but at least three months after infection. Which vaccine? Well, there's a consensus currently to consider that the mRNA vaccine is as most appropriate. Uh, While well, the use of AstraZeneca has been restricted in many countries like France to patients below 65, and of course there might be new options with the release of other vaccines. So when would, should the patient be vaccinated? Well, prior to starting therapy if possible, and if the patients who are already on therapy anytime, uh, treatment should not be discontinued, and uh, the option that our French immunologists have, are very keen upon is that the second dose should not be delayed uh, for immuno, immune, immunocompromised patients, maximum four weeks after the first dose. Are there contraindications to vaccination? Well, there are very little. The only contraindication is a severe allergic reaction at the first dose or an immediate allergic reaction of any severity to two components of the vaccine, which are polysorbates and polyethylene glycol. Uh, concerning the allergy, a lot of patients are allergic, and uh, the only uh, real um, caution that we should have is for patients who have a prior severe allergy to injectable therapies or iodine, and it's recommended to vaccinate these patients in allergy specialized centers. Otherwise, there is no specific precaution for any other allergic reactions, including severe anaphylactic reaction to food components or environmental allergies or to oral medication. And it's important to know that vaccines contain no egg, no gelatin, no latex, and no preservatives. Uh, I think the only caution that we have as CLL doctors, uh, there is absolutely no basis for that, but uh, uh, we uh, are just cautious on the safety and efficacy of mRNA vaccines in persons with autoimmune conditions, but uh, we don't have any signal, uh, unfavorable signals from clinical trials, but it's just a, a caution that uh, uh, we are thinking of. So the CDC has uh, uh, given a recommendation for immune compromised patient post vaccination that are exactly the same as the public health recommendation. Um, we, we don't know exactly actually if how much the mRNA COVID vaccines may reduce transmission in the general population. We don't know how long the protection is going to last. So it's important that the vaccinated persons should continue to follow all current guidance to protect themselves and others. And uh, well, you know what it includes, wearing a mask, uh, uh, washing hands and so on. And uh, the last point is that uh, given the lack of data on the safety and efficacy of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines uh, administered simultaneously with other vaccines, uh, it has been recommended that the minimum interval of 14 days should be, uh, uh, sh sh should be respected. Okay, so um, I tried to be brief. I don't know if I succeeded, but uh, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Simbalista. Uh, the question will be asked at the end of all presentation. So that I give the floor now uh, for our acute leukemia, leukemia expert, Dr. Amit Patel. Your, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for such an excellent uh, overview of 
uh, the vaccines as well as um, uh, the, the limitations in terms of the available data. I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the situation for patients with acute leukemia, including those treated with hemopoietic stem cell transplantation and available uh, CAR T cell therapies. Um, these are uh, my uh, disclosures here. Um, so if we if we then uh, start the journey, really looking at well, what what is the outcome of patients with acute leukemia that uh, get COVID nineteen? I think what we can see from um, the data here is that there is a, a an age distribution that's similar to the general population. In other words, older patients tend to unfortunately have a, a higher risk of dying uh, in relation to infection. It, there's a similar relationship with uh, more men dying uh, compared to women in relation to uh, COVID-19 in, in, in the AML and, and AML. Apologies to interrupt you, Dr. Patel. We can't see your um, slides. For some reason, it's just showing us that you're screen sharing. And I think a couple of the attendees are having that issue as well. So maybe you could um, turn the slide screen off and then turn it back on again. <laughs> sure. Same for uh, me, uh, Zach. Perhaps uh, Nicole could share the, the slides of uh, Dr. Patel. Uh, yeah, uh, otherwise I'll Whatever have... Whatever you like, uh, you can try again. If it doesn't work, I'm happy to jump in. Okay. So I hope everybody can see that now. No, I can't. Oh, yes. oh, now we do. Oh, now we do. Again. Perfect. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, th these, are, these are the data in patients uh, in, a, in, in a U.S. Um, repository, and these are patients with uh, acute leukemia. You can see the older patients um, have a higher risk of dying. You can see that in the red bars here uh, in the 40 to 65 and greater than 70 uh, age group. More men compared to women are unfortunately uh, getting the infection. And the type of comorbidities that um, are associated with infection are the ones that are reported in the general population. So diabetes, hypertension, some autoimmune uh, diseases, some other chronic um, renal uh, and, uh, and lung diseases. So in the main, actually, the outcomes are not that dissimilar to those patients in the uh, general population in relation to um, the pattern of infection and the outcome of, from infection. In relation to transplantation and cellular therapy, you can see here uh, the number of patients uh, that have been reported in the registry in relation to these therapies is low. But if we, if we take them in turn, you can see that there is a uh, high rate of um, uh, non-survival outcome in patients post CAR-T therapy, for mainly for ALL, and patients uh, post allogeneic stem cell transplantation, uh, mainly for AML, and also autologous transplantation uh, in, in addition. If we think about how to manage these patients, I've already said that the outcome is, is uh, largely dependent on the outcome in relation to similar members of the general population uh, based on age and comorbidity. And so in the UK, we have a, an algorithm which we use uh, for all patients. So anybody who has an oxygen requirement uh, gets treated with dexamethasone based on the uh, pivotal data uh, from the recovery study. Um, and that provides a survival uh, benefit in the ICU and outside of the ICU. We also treat patients with remdesivir uh, if they meet certain criteria. And because there were no significant survival data showing a benefit with this drug, uh, the, the use of this is selected. And then more recently, data released from the uh, remap CAP trial in the UK uh, showed that tocilizumab and sarolizumab, interleukin-6 inhibitors, uh, used within 24 hours of organ impairment requiring critical care unit support uh, uh, conferred survival benefit with treatment. Uh, so now we, we use this. And this algorithm is exactly the same as the algorithm we use uh, for the general population. And we use the same algorithm for patients who have acute leukemia, whether they're in the post-transplant state or the post-CAR-T state. If we then look at vaccines, uh, and we've heard um, a very nice description and detail of the vaccines, I suppose, when, when, it, when it comes to patients with leukemia, actually only the Pfizer vaccine reportedly had 76 patients with leukemia and lymphoma. We, we don't really have any more details in relation to this. Um, none of the other vaccines, as far as uh, I understand, had, uh, at least had included these patients or at least knowingly included these patients. 
Um, we know that only the Pfizer vaccine can be used in uh, patients um, that are 16 years of age or older. Otherwise, the other vaccines are only um, tested in the adult population. And you can see the efficacy post dose one and post dose two shown here. Um, and the, these data are taken from the British Society for Blood and Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapy uh, in a recent update. What about the transplant and cell therapy population then? Uh, what, what, what do we expect are the, are the outcomes in this group where the data are very sparse? This study from the US uh, reported uh, in 77 patients who had uh, been treated with one of these forms of cellular therapy. But actually the outcomes were favorable uh, for patients who didn't have uncontrolled disease. Um, patients actually had a, a, a good treatment course with um, half of patients treated in the outpatient setting, so non-severe COVID. Um, antibodies were detected, uh, even in sometimes when uh, context when the B cell numbers were low. Um, and we've heard a little bit about uh, the importance of T cell uh, and cellular immunity in addition to antibody mediated immunity. Um, and the other thing that was uh, found was there was actually a reduction in lymphocytes um, following recovery post-infection. And so a typical pattern of lymphocytes might be uh, an, an, um, uh, an increase after the cellular therapy in question, infection, which then drives down the lymphocyte count, and then in, during recovery, the lymphocyte count recovers. Um, in that particular study, you can see here in terms of survival, all patients post autologous transplantation had the best and highest survival out to uh, almost 60 days here. And patients post allogeneic stem cell transplant or post CAR T cell therapy, although the numbers of patients are small, had a similar outcome, which was probably inferior to those patients post autologous stem cell transplant. And that's not surprising because these two groups, allo transplant and CAR T therapy, have a long and severe immune paresis. And you can see that here, when you look at B cell numbers, CD19 is a B cell marker, you can see that B cell numbers in the small number of CAR-T patients was zero. You can see it was around 50 in those who had an autologous transplant. And you can see it was low at uh, a median of eight in those who had allogeneic stem cell transplant. So based on B cell numbers, CAR-T patients are the most uh, vulnerable, uh, followed by allo transplant patients, followed by autologous transplant patients. And in terms of T cell uh, immunity, so CD4 and 8 cells, you can see again that in the post CAR T cell space, CD4 numbers are the lowest amongst all the, all the forms of cellular therapy, but actually CD8 numbers are slightly higher. And that's not surprising because the, the uh, cellular therapy itself um, might be expanded and that might inflate the numbers of CD8 positive uh, T cells that are, that are present. You can see in the corner here that if you follow the PCR viral, viral load, you can see actually that it's variable in different patients, each line is a different patient, and it can persist as positive for a long period of time. If we take a few examples of individual patients now, you can see uh, lots of different patterns emerging. So on the left-hand side, you can see a patient who's early post-allogeneic stem cell transplant, around the, the day 100 mark, you can see that their total lymphocyte count shown here in purple drops uh, with, with viral infection, and you can see PCR positivity occurring. Um, this is in the context of somebody who's still on immune suppression, has got graft versus host disease. You can see that an antibody level taken um, some time later remains negative. PCR positivity remains and then becomes negative. And associated with that is recovery of the absolute lymphocyte count. And you can see the B cell numbers uh, shown in, in dark purple right at the bottom stay relatively low. So in other words, you don't need B cell numbers to be high to clear virus, but you can see that this patient did not mount an, uh, um, an antibody response uh, subsequent infection. On the right hand side, however, what you can see is um, a different patient who gets infected, has the lymphocyte count drop, and then um, despite re um, recovery of the lymphocyte count to, to higher than, than uh, pre-infection, the patient remains positive at, for COVID-19. So PCR positivity remains for a long period of time, almost a year after the, uh, the infection. And the second, uh, sorry, uh, almost um, 100 days after the infection. And what you can see is that uh, 
The positivity remains despite the fact that this patient has got an antibody response, IgG positivity has occurred. And, and this patient received uh, tocilizumab as part of their treatment for COVID-19, and they were on uh, ongoing immune suppression. The, uh, th these two uh, illustrate slightly different patterns. Here you can see a patient who has PCR positivity, lymphocyte count drops, B cell number uh, CD19 in dark purple at the very bottom stays quite low. PCR becomes positive, then becomes negative some time later. And uh, just before the patient clears virus, they, they develop an IgG antibody response that's positive, And soon after that becomes negative. So they, they have a short-lived antibody response. The patient on the right-hand side, you can see, um, has got uh, graft versus host disease, is on uh, significant immune suppression, and is early post-transplant. And what you can see here is this patient does not clear virus, and this patient does not mount an antibody response. Uh, and to finish now, uh, we've got somebody who's got a variable lymphocyte count despite the fact that's shown in the top light purple curve. And, and despite that, you can see the uh, B cell numbers remain flat at the bottom. Um, however, this patient is able to uh, clear the virus and mount an antibody response without detectable peripheral blood B cells. Uh, and the last patient who is many, many years out uh, post transplant with their leukemia has recovered from their diseases in long-term remission, um, develops COVID-19, is treated with some steroid and then recovers. And during the, the development of COVID-19, uh, you could see a drop in the lymphocyte count, which, which recovered. What's interesting is that their B cell numbers are normal, so dark purple. Um, they drop during infection and they don't really recover well some time after infection. So in fact, the B cell numbers in patients post allergy transplant may take a longer time to recover maybe many months, maybe six to 12 months uh, be be before that occurs. And that has implications for other types of infections as well. If we think about um, transplant activity and CAR T activity, you can see from this graph taken from data from the European Blood and Marrow Transplant Registry, that despite the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK and across Europe, there's been really very little uh, change in the trajectory of the increase in CAR T patient infusion. That's in contrast to patients who have presented with acute leukemia for the first time. And that's also in contrast to patients who have uh, gone on to receive allogeneic stem cell transplantation for acute leukemia, where there's been significant impact of delays, both in terms of access to uh, donors, particularly unrelated donors, and to some extent related donors, uh, mainly because of deferral due to COVID-19 infection. If we look at uh, the complexity of CAR T cell therapy for acute leukemia, what we can see, uh, and, and the, these, these products can be used in clinical trials for CLL, what we can see is actually the uh, manufacturing after uh, a leukophoresis procedure, uh, which takes a number of weeks, um, can become interrupted in terms of supply chain and in terms of COVID-19 infection in The, the source of the cells, so the patient, and also in the staff looking after the patient and uh, involved in manufacturing. Therefore, um, in terms of the impact and immune recovery post cellular therapy, what we can say is that it can impact all stages of the patient pathway from procurement of cells prior to genetic modification or procurement of donor cells uh, prior to transplantation infusion of the cellular therapy, uh, whether that's CAR-T or, or transplantation, and then long-term recovery in the, in the medium and, the, and uh, the short term as well. And it's important to note that even if infection occurs post-infusion or, or pre-infusion, there is going to be an impact both from an immunological response and in terms of a logistical uh, and, uh, facilities uh, response as well. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Patel. Now on the voice of the regulator uh, with uh, Dr. Julio Delgado. Please uh, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. So uh, my name is Julio Delgado. I am a hematologist. Uh, but currently working at the European Medicines Agency as a second national expert. 
So uh, we, we all know that drugs in general need to go through a number of steps uh, to be developed and approved and um, COVID-19 vaccines are no uh, exception to that. The next one, please. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole process uh, because you all know what it entails, but I would like just to highlight the fact that normally uh, one process starts when the other, the previous one ends. So for instance, if you do uh, non-clinical research, uh, once you've completed non-clinical research, you start with phase one, then if you complete phase one trial, you go uh, for phase two and so on and so forth. So this is what normally happens uh, for any drug uh, that is developed. The next. Uh, for COVID-19 vaccines, uh, things have changed. And, and you can see that all the different uh, processes and steps are uh, sort of superimposed. And this has been accomplished uh, by something that is called a rolling review uh, that I'll explain in the next slide. So a uh, rolling review uh, is used in, in situations like this one, like public health emergencies, and allows the EMA to evaluate data uh, as soon as it is available. Uh, so um, several rolling review cycles can be done as data continue to emerge. So uh, the, the EMA receives uh, one batch of data and can evaluate it and then the next step and then the next step. So uh, the, the regulator doesn't have to wait until everything is done uh, to, to carry on the evaluation. And, and you see here the difference between the standard way of evaluating drugs and the rolling review that's taking place uh, for all the COVID-19 vaccines. Next. But it is very important to highlight the fact that COVID-19 vaccines are approved according to the same standards that apply to all medicines in the EU. So the fact that uh, these drugs have been evaluated in, in, in a different way with such rolling reviews does not mean that the standards are compromised in any way. Um, when regarding uh, evaluation and decision, the next one, um, the, the EMA has decided that these drugs, these vaccines, uh, would be granted conditional marketing authorization. And this type of authorization is not new. It's not something that was uh, made up for COVID-19 vaccines. It's been there for many, many years. There are many uh, oncology drugs that have been approved uh, as, as, as conditional for conditional marketing authorization. For instance, polatuzumab comes to mind uh, when it was approved for the treatment of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it, it was uh, using this path. Um, these uh, conditional marketing authorizations are uh, for medicines that address unmet medical needs. And, and the benefit of having these drugs available immediately outweighs the risks of doing that before having comprehensive data. Um, again, this, this is for medicines intended for treating, preventing, or diagnosis seriously debilitating or life-threatening diseases, and also for public health emergencies. And I'm sure you all agree with me that uh, COVID-19 disease uh, fulfills the whole thing. Uh, it's a public health emergency. It's a seriously debilitating and life-threatening disease. What is very important about conditional marketing authorization is that uh, the company commits to providing further uh, data after approval, for instance, long-term safety data that generally is not available by the time the drugs are submitted for uh, marketing authorization. So one of the key aspects of conditional marketing authorization is this, the commitment that the company, a legally binding commitment that the company makes in providing uh, this long-term safety data after approval. Um, so again, 
why uh, the EMA decided to go for conditional marketing authorization, because it's, it's a formal approval of a medicine across the EU. That means that all member states benefit from the joint scientific assessment and approval. So no member states are left behind. Uh, everybody gets uh, the drug approved at the same time. Um, despite that being, let's say, fast, it has all the safeguards and controls in place to ensure high level of protection. And again, things that are important for conditional marketing authorizations. There must be a robust monitoring plan uh, for managing safety. There has to be a, cle a clear legal framework for evaluation of, of efficacy data. There must be manufacturing controls, uh, including batch controls for vaccines. So specifically, uh, of course, um, there has to be uh, a clear uh, package leaflet and SMPC available. And this is, of course, evaluated by the committees. Very important as well, uh, there has to be a plan for use of the vaccine in children. All drugs that are granted conditional marketing authorization have a, a, a pediatric plan uh, uh, agreed. And you know, this is particularly important because all vaccines approved so far have been approved for uh, people older than 16 in one case or over 18. And again, uh, additional studies or other data that the company is legally obliged to provide with the fine timelines. So that this is all the, these are the reasons why the, the EMA decided to go for conditional marketing authorization for all COVID-19 vaccines. In terms of manufacturing, next one. Um, something that that happens normally is by the time of approval, uh, the production capacity for any given drug is small and it, w it builds up with time. Here, the manufacturers are under a lot of pressure and, and it's, it's a bit the other way around. So um, they need to have production capacity built up by the time the drugs are approved. And this is putting the manufacturers under a lot of stress as well. Next one. In terms of safety monitoring, that's another, this is another key aspect uh, and, and EMA is working hard uh, to, to have comprehensive safety monitoring and risk management. And this is all within what is called the EU pharmacovigilance system. And, and here we all play a part. So patients are important for monitoring safety of these new vaccines. Of course, healthcare professionals, regulatory agencies, both at, at, at the European level, but also at the national level, and then uh, national healthcare systems, and obviously marketing authorization holders. Next. Another aspect that is very important for the EMA is transparency. And, and I have to tell you that the EMA has gone through exceptional, it's taken exceptional measures for COVID-19 uh, medicines. Medicine. So here in this table, you can see the difference between what is standard practice, what, what is the information that the EMA typically publish, publishes for any drug that is approved and how these measures have been uh, increased for COVID-19 vaccines. So for instance, scientific advice uh, in, in, for any other drug, there's no information whatsoever about what drugs are being advised or not. For COVID-19 vaccines, there's a list of medicines and that list is publicly available uh, showing all the uh, drug companies and, and vaccines that have been advised. Uh, whenever a rolling review is start, uh, that is also publicly announced. So for instance, last week, uh, uh, the EMA announced that the, the, there's another vaccine that is currently being evaluated, the Novavax vaccine that was announced last week. This doesn't happen normally for other drugs. Uh, in terms of uh, the marketing authorization application uh, for standard practice, this is generally uh, that information is available uh, in an active substance list in the medicines under evaluation. For COVID-19 vaccines, the announcement is published within one day of application. So again, expediting all the, 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 the time that that takes to publish all that information. The EPA, the European Public Assessment Report, uh, is generally published um, sometime after the 
the uh, drug is is approved uh, uh, with the EPAR and and for uh, COVID-19 vaccines is again published uh, very fast the product information within one day and the EPAR ideally within a week of the marketing authorization and finally monthly safety reports these are normally not published uh, but for COVID-19 vaccines, they are published uh, monthly. And indeed, we've all, uh, the EMA has already published the first uh, safety update uh, for the first uh, vaccine approved, the Pfizer vaccine that was published last week as well. So next one. Um, uh, in, in relation with patients with cancer in general or uh, um, leukemia or lymphoma, um, this has been stated already. Uh, the truth is that patients with cancer require an active therapy uh, and immunocompromised patients were excluded from, from pivotal trials. We know the information from the Pfizer pivotal trial. We, we know, only have that information as, as Dr. Patel uh, mentioned that around 4% of patients included in the Pfizer pivotal trial had a prior history of malignancy. We know that they didn't have active treatment at the time because they would have been excluded, but they at least had that uh, history of malignancy. We also know that uh, although these people may not respond well to the vaccine, there are no particular safety concerns. Uh, so there's no expectation for these patients to have any safety problems. And this is why the EMA concluded that the benefit risk ratio for patients with cancer or immunocompromised uh, patients is positive and therefore is recommended. There's no formal contraindication or anything like that. Next one. Um, so I'm just going to conclude here to say that uh, COVID-19 vaccines, the same assessment was performed as for any other uh, medicines. The timelines were shortened thanks to rolling review, but the standards were the same for quality, safety, and efficacy. And, and, and the EMA is following the conditional marketing authorization route that again is not a new thing, is, is, a, is a process, is a tool that was already available for drugs in the European Union. Exceptional measures are taken to maximize transparency uh, for COVID-19 vaccines and treatments as well. So the same applies not only to vaccines, but any treatment that, that, that is intended for COVID-19. Uh, again, a strong EU pharmacovigilance system is in place uh, so that safety will not com be compromised. And again, in terms of safety, uh, this will get better if we all uh, help and, and provide information on problems that we may encounter with the use of vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Delgado. Now it's time to tell us the story of the viruses. Uh, Professor Liebert, you have the floor. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. And let me just start. Um, oh, could you just show the next slide? Okay, um, the topics I, I'm dealing with is uh, of course, how do these uh, coronavirus mutations occur? And this is probably the major uh, topic of what I'm, I'm talking about today. Uh, I will come back to the, to the next uh, questions as well. So if you, if you look at the genomic similarity of the human sars cov uh, 2 and the origin of the virus, this is bat coronavirus, then you see that the bat coronaviruses in this region and uh, here differ to some extent from the um, uh, human coronavirus. Um, this, the difference is particularly in the uh, transcription machinery and it is uh, less um, um, uh, important in, in the surface uh, uh, gene, in, in, the, uh, 
in that region that, that uh, codes for the spike protein. Next slide, please. Okay, Wh how do viral mutations occur? Uh, first to start with is uh, these are uh, events that occur at random and they are naturally occurring. It's nothing that you um, so somehow forced to, to happen. And it's uh, the case that most of the RNA viruses do not, not have a machinery to exclude uh, or to repair mutations. Mutations are probably just um, errors by multiplication of the viral genome. Um, the coronavirus has such repair mechanisms and that's why the mutation rate is lower than it is in usual uh, RNA viruses. What we have, there are two different types of mutations. There are silent mutations and missense mutations. The silent mutations mean that there is a change in the uh, nucleotide sequence, but no change in the proteins. So only the missense uh, mutations uh, do change the protein composition. And these changes could be, in uh, view of the virus, disadvantages, disadvantages, so the virus is somehow dying or is less fit for replication, maybe insignificant, or it may be in view of the virus favorable. And it's only the, these favorable mutations that are raising, are giving rise to concerns because these favorable mutations may potentially impact, have an impact on the transmissibility of viruses, the mortality and lethality of a virus-induced disease, and of course, uh, towards uh, the vaccine efficiency. Next, yeah. Um, so if you, if you look at, at this and probably short of a small summer, summer, uh, summary, uh, so the SARS coronavirus is the result of a mutated animal virus. Um, we do not know exactly how many mute, uh, steps of mutation were happening. Um, what we know is that the SARS coronavirus now in the human uh, body mutates continuously. So we have quite a number of mutations, hundreds of mutations in fact, um, but only a few are uh, giving rise to concern. Which mutation develop is rather unpredictable. So we cannot be sure when and what happens. The biological properties of our variants are not foreseeable whatsoever. So you never know if a mutation wherever in the genome will um, make the, the, the virus more aggressive or less aggressive or something. And this is probably the major reason or the main reason for a close monitoring, that means viral sequencing of newly developing variants. And this, uh, Viral sequencing is crucial for the progression of the pandemic. So if you see um, a variant, then you have to uh, get uh, or undertake uh, certain uh, measures. Next slide, please. And which are the critical points uh, or the critical proteins uh, for mutation? This is a cartoon of the virus and you see the four major uh, structure proteins. And one of them, there's a spike protein that actually binds to the receptor, so the entry uh, molecule uh, into cells. So virus mutations in the spike protein could alter the virus entry into cells, and the cells need to be infected, otherwise virus does not replicate. It may uh, hinder the recognition by the immune system, and by this may um, take uh, so interfere with the development of individual immunity or the community immunity, so the herd immunity. So mutations could be very important in this uh, respect and ultimately have an uh, 
impact on the vaccine development because, and this is already uh, well known or there are hints in the literature that certain mutations in the spike protein may uh, uh, reduce the efficacy of certain vaccines. This is another important uh, uh, point. Next slide, please. So I have talked about uh, the SARS corona uh, virus mutations. And now one of the uh, questions um, that needs to be answered is, um, could it be that immune compromised patients uh, are probably favoring uh, mutations? So do more mutations occur in immunocompromised patients? That in a way could be true, but it has not really been shown uh, so far. Uh, but we know that uh, patients with or persons with a re uh, reduced immune response could generate or, or allow mutations to uh, expand in the individual. Um, the question, of course, immediately uh, uh, coming from this uh, point, should they be, be uh, should patients or uh, patients with an immune compromised uh, disease, uh, should they rank uh, higher in the vaccination priority list? This of course is a matter uh, and, and will be decided by the national governments, but just from the uh, scientific um, uh, standpoint, um, I think there's good, there's good uh, evidence to uh, say yes, I should probably be rank higher uh, and get probably a preventive treatment. That's probably not the, uh, the point here, but it's uh, they should be vaccinated. And um, well, uh, is, there, is there a measure of specific incidence of COVID-19 immunosuppressed? I think the data are not sufficient to, to really say that for sure. And does vaccination really help to reach herd immunity? I think for the time being, uh, the, the um, uh, percentage of the population in different countries uh, is not high enough to be any near herd immunity that may be close, uh, for example, in Israel, but definitely not in the European countries. So herd immunity is not directly, but only in the long uh, run, maybe, important uh, or the herd immunity may be reached by vaccination. So I think this is basically what I wanted to, to uh, say and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Liebert. Uh, that was quite interesting indeed. And thank you for, uh, for having uh, answered the question we asked up front. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can now begin with uh, trying and answer the questions that have been uh, asked by the audience. Uh, I will start with the first one and Zach is of course uh, complete. The first one is probably uh, addressed to the, to the clinicians. Uh, are there plans for all immune compromised patients to be monitored after vaccination to check if antibodies hold up. There are strong doubts uh, from uh, how the vaccination will work for this vulnerable group. Um, do you want me to, to answer? Yes, please. Uh, okay, I can answer for CLL. Um, I think that, uh, of course, there has been already discussions and uh, we have a national plan to um, uh, study the, uh, um, uh, the, the immune response to um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination in CLL patients. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to, to merge this data with uh, data from other countries. And, um, but uh, right now there is uh, not yet uh, uh, a very, um, uh, the, this is not yet organized, but uh, we are organized in France because we have started vaccination of um, immune compromised patients, but 
two weeks ago. And uh, so um, we'll be able to do it uh, quite soon. Thank you. Zach, a question perhaps? Yeah, uh, Dr. Patel, do you want to comment from the perspective of acute leukemia on the same question? Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think um, the, uh, certainly in the UK and for uh, acute leukemia as well, the, the, there are um, wishes to study this. And I think it's quite clear, it's, very important, it's a very important unanswered question to address. Um, there are differences in different countries. In the UK, everybody with um, acute leukemia or chronic leukemia um, is classified as clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and in the tiered vaccination program, those patients are in the fourth group uh, from the top. And those patients are, uh, you know, are, are going to be routinely vaccinated. Um, in terms of the antibody response, I think it's already been sort of alluded to by um, uh, the others that actually the antibody response alone may not be uh, the best measure of uh, protection against this virus, particularly in this immunocompromised population. Um, particularly also, uh, as I illustrated, that the B cell numbers are very low in some of these patients. Um, and so some measure of T cell function as well as B cell function is, is, is important. So those studies are ongoing. So for example, there is a study in the UK looking at uh, patients who've developed um, COVID-19 in post-transplant, uh, most of those patients have acute leukemia, and, and that is collecting blood samples to try and address this question. But there are challenges because, of course, everybody's vaccinated, so <laughs> there will be an antibody response from vaccination. The antibody response should be against the spike protein rather than other um, uh, uh, moieties like, uh, for example, the nuclear capsid. And so although there are antibody assays against those other amoities, um, they're not readily available in the UK. So in terms of a standard of care assessment, that's really not possible today in, in, in the UK and in most countries. But in terms of clinical studies, yeah, those, those samples are being collected uh, systematically. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I may just say something, um, uh, because uh, we have uh, an assay that is readily available in France uh, for uh, antibody against spike protein. So uh, and there, is, uh, there are even uh, several, so you don't have that in the UK. So um, there's, there's, I suppose, two issues. One is um, the spike protein assay is not um, going to be particularly helpful for the UK population, a lot of the uh, patients with um, CLL and ALL either have been or will soon be vaccinated. Uh, and so the spike protein you would expect to uh, tell you something about vaccination rather than about infection per se. So patients who get natural infection will, will get uh, antibodies against spike, but also other, other surface um, protein or other proteins in the virus. Um, and in terms of um, access, so the, the, these tests are available, but they're not clinically available uh, because I think they've just been requisitioned uh, and, and resources have been pooled and redirected to uh, the national effort rather than uh, um, making these, these uh, assays um, available to small labs. But I think they, they are going to be crucial um, in the future and, and samples are being stored and, and taken systematically. Uh, so a, a really interesting question we've had here um, about whether the vaccine impacts on transmission of the virus. Um, and maybe we could start with Dr. Delgado. Um, but if, if we know that it might do to some extent, why are the those who live with the clinically extremely vulnerable, are they being prioritised and should they be more prioritised? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, um, well, what we know about the vaccines, the approved vaccines, is they've been approved because they prevent severe disease. And, and this is what they do. And this is why they've been approved. So there's still a lot to learn about virus transmissibility. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, but the good thing is that a lot of information will be provided to the EMA because of this conditional marketing authorization. So we'll have that information very soon. So what we know for sure is that it prevents severe disease. That, that what we know for sure. Uh, regarding prioritization, prioritization what, um, 
Well, the EMA has evaluated all risk groups. It has evaluated all possible populations, and it, it has decided that the benefit risk is positive for all those uh, groups. So that includes cancer patients, that includes uh, pregnant women, it includes all, all sort of uh, situations. Um, but, but it's not really within the EMA's remit to decide who should get the vaccine first. So the EMA is there to decide whether it is safe, whether the benefit risk ratio is positive for that particular group, but not really to, to decide who should be first and who should be second. Well, thank you. I, I have, a, well, I guess a, a silly question uh, about the regulation. If we uh, have a look on the decision of the different uh, regulator, be it uh, FDA, be it EMA, be it the, the, the health regulator in, uh, in the UK, we see, uh, well, let's say significant differences uh, in the delay for becoming, uh, for, for getting a decision and uh, also so uh, uh, a discrepancy about the recommendations, for instance, AstraZeneca uh, being uh, uh, well applicable to to the the elder elderly people or not? Do you have an explanation? <laughs> it's a silly question. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, regarding uh, the differences between EMA and other regulatory agencies, uh, the main difference is that the EMA has decided to grant conditional marketing authorizations to this. To this. So the EMA is not trying to get what it's called an emergency authorization use as other uh, regulatory agencies have decided. So the EMA decided right from the beginning that it will expedite as much as, as they could the, the scientific assessment, but uh, the, the final goal was always to grant a conditional marketing authorization because that allows for rigorous evaluation of the vaccines. And uh, so, you know, you, you, you have to make sure that the all standards for safety, efficacy and quality are there. And, and very importantly, that no uh, European country is left behind. So uh, it is, it, it, that was a decision that was made. Other countries have gone for emergency authorization uh, use authorizations, and these are different. These are temporary authorizations for supply and use. These are not marketing authorizations. And, and these are available at the level of individual EU uh, member states. So these emergency use authorizations are governed by national legislation and the EU cannot really, uh, does not have that mechanism. Uh, uh, it cannot grant that type of, of uh, authorization at the EU level. So that, that, is, that explains partly why there are differences. Regarding the age issue, uh, well, the, the, the EMA evaluated the AstraZeneca vaccine and, and there was 13% of the population was older than 65. And the EMA actually decided that, that the benefit risk uh, ratio for that population was positive. So actually the EMA uh, granted uh, a conditional marketing authorization that includes uh, patients older than 65. So from that point of view, there's no discrepancy. Thank you. Very interesting question. Very clear. Thank you. <laughs> so we've, me. we've had a, it's fine. We've had a good question in as to many of our audience are patient advocates and representing patient organizations. Should we as advocates and organizations encourage our patients to accept a vaccine when offered? Um, maybe Professor Sibylista, you could comment first for CLL. Um, well, um, am I mute? Can you hear no, me? No, we, we can hear you. Okay. Um, oh, oh, definitely, yes. Uh, I think that uh, even if we don't have uh, any uh, 
real um, data showing the efficacy of the vaccine, uh, even if the efficacy is reduced, I think that uh, we are quite uh, uh, on the safe side. And uh, I would say there is no reason why the safety of this vaccine would, should be different in uh, immune compromised patients. And uh, considering the efficacy, even if it's reduced, it's better than nothing. So um, I think definitely uh, patients should be uh, vaccinated. And I would say that uh, there is also a level of emergency uh, to try to vaccinate the patients who are the most fragile, uh, which are the ones who are treated or have been recently treated. And the same question to Dr. Patel for acute leukemia. And are there any circumstances in which you would say, no, we shouldn't be vaccinating acute leukemia patients? So um, uh, in a word, yes, everybody should be vaccinated. Um, you wouldn't want to vaccinate if there's a contraindication specific to the vaccine in relation to uh, allergic uh, responses or, or, or uh, autoimmune disease or something that uh, the vaccine label itself says is a contraindication for whichever vaccine you, uh, the, the, the patient is offered. But if there is no contraindication, uh, everybody should be vaccinated. In terms of when you could do it, I suppose the patients you might not want to vaccinate are the patients who are newly presenting, who haven't started treatment yet. Those patients, if they need urgent treatment in the next few days or week, those patients really should be treated and don't really need to be vaccinated at that point. Uh, but then subsequently after recovery, I think those patients can be vaccinated. Otherwise, um, uh, patients who have had some treatment and recovered or, or completed treatment and recovered, all of those patients should be vaccinated unless there's a, some other, other medical sort of reason why that, that shouldn't occur. In the post-allo setting, uh, patients shouldn't, should, typically should uh, be vaccinated two to three months after the stem cell transplant has occurred, um, can be vaccinated earlier. It's not um, recommended in the UK and in Europe, the timelines slightly differ, um, but uh, the, the recommendation is that patients who are still having immune suppression therapy or lots of treatment for acute or chronic graft versus disease perhaps may not get a, a great response and, and may not you know, benefit fully from vaccination. I have to say, from our perspective in the UK, because we have no control over vaccination slots, which are um, allotted in the community, unless there's a strong contraindication to vaccination, actually, we say to patients, whenever you're offered a vaccine, just take it, regardless of those, other, regardless of the other circumstances I mentioned uh, in the, in the post-transplant setting. Uh, again, post-CAR T therapy, um, the recommendation in the UK is to have it after six months based on, um, but th there is no real data as, has, as everybody has discussed. So, um, we've, we've taken a pragmatic view that the B cells are not going to recover for perhaps longer than that. So as long as the, the, the patient's recovered from the therapy, so that's usually one month, the patients can be vaccinated if they're offered. Thank you. I see here a, a quite a global question, of a global, uh, focused on, uh, on uh, immunodepressed uh, uh, patient, of course. Does the panel agree uh, that there is a need of biomarkers in place in the future to inform immunocompromised people about their individual level of protection after vaccination? Otherwise, we face lifelong shielding as long as this virus circulates. Uh, should I should I say something about that, Pierre? The, um, if if you're vaccinated, then that should not be the case. So, if a patient is vaccinated, um, they they should they they should um, develop some level of protection. And we we talked a few minutes, moments ago about you know how that can be measured and the challenges that that um, in terms of measuring the level of protection and what the challenges might be. But if somebody's vaccinated, then actually they they should get a, at least some degree of protection. I think we also have to hope for at some point some herd immunity that will. Uh, um, I don't think that we'll be able to have uh, the possibility to test everybody uh, for uh, protection. And I'm not sure we have the right tools right now developed uh, for um, in the community. But we're certainly working on it. 
Uh, so another question, um, and I'll go to you, Professor Simbalista. Um, are you giving any guidance to your patients on the different types of vaccines and whether they should um, have a preference for any of those vaccines or do they just take the first one that's offered to them? Well, I try to explain the differences in, in the vaccines the way I explain uh, them to you, but uh, uh, they have no choice. They, they get what they what they are given. So uh, and right now they are not given anything. So um, the problem is that uh, we are really short in vaccines currently in France. Uh, only patients who are above seventy five can get vaccination outside of the hospitals. Uh, myself, I have tried, uh, I was able to vaccine over 40 patients by getting some Pfizer vaccines uh, uh, from the hospital, but uh, uh, it, it was a long fight. And um, I think it's uh, uh, right now, uh, from uh, what I understand, uh, in France, the AstraZeneca vaccine will be distributed only to the younger patients. Uh, and um, uh, I think that they should get uh, what they should get uh, the earlier. Thank you. And a similar question to you, Dr. Patel, about acute leukemia and particularly from the UK. So I, I think um, the first thing to say is there is really no data um, to justify, you know, one vaccine over another for, for our patients. And um, the, the pragmatic view then taken by most people in the UK is, is whichever vaccine is offered is likely to be beneficial. Um, so we, we, we don't provide a preference um, and um, th there is a there is a vaccination schedule which is gone down actually I have to, I have to say it's, it's it is extremely surprisingly efficient how, how, how good it has been um, and you know I might see a patient in clinic one week I see them the next week and they've already been vaccinated <laughs> and it's it's very it's a very efficient um, uh, machine so I, I think whichever vaccine is available um that's the that's the one that should be taken um uh, in this respect uh, just, a, a just, question just, uh, excuse me zach sorry gone after you pierre okay uh, in this respect a question about uh, the prioritization of the different patients how can we lobby in different countries of course uh, to get a higher priority for the for the uh, immune depressed uh, patients such as the CLL or AL uh, patients Well, I think that it's very always very important to have patient advocates uh, uh, helping us to um, promote uh, what 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 we are asking. Um, I think that uh, at least in France, it has been uh, heard that uh, immune compromised patients uh, should be uh, on the top of the list. Uh, I think that right now uh, the shortage, the shortage uh, is uh, that is present now is going to be relieved, and uh, we'll be able to vaccinate uh, more widely. Um, I, I don't know for other countries uh, how you can help. Other so opinions in the panel. No, uh, perhaps we'll move on to a different question then. Um, so, Professor Libert, you mentioned during your talk that there was an increased likelihood that those with, who were immunocompromised might develop more mutations. Um, could you maybe expand on this a little bit more? We've had some questions about it. So, uh, if you have an immunocompromised patient uh, or a person with immunocompromised disease, then uh, you're less able and less efficient in combating the virus. So the virus and the viral genome stays for an extended period of time in the body. And since the rate of mutation depends, of course, not only on the length of the genome, but also on the time the genome is present. So this is just a mathematical likelihood, just a statistical likelihood that you have more mutations. We have seen 
in some, in very few patients in, in Leipzig, uh, that immunocompromised patients tend to have a, a higher um, viral load and for a more extended period of time. And that's the basis why I say mutations could occur. Uh, okay. in, in this respect, uh, Professor Liebert, uh, as we see that uh, several mutations are occurring, uh, some, well, uh, most of them uh, rather uh, concerning, uh, let's say, do you expect that we will have to, to be vaccinated uh, once a year, uh, depending upon the different uh, uh, mutation that uh, could occur in the future? Well, uh, that is, a, it's a good question, but we all do not know how long our uh, immune response persists after natural infection and after immunization. So it could well be that after a year or after two years or probably after six months, we have to revaccinate. And um, so the, the data are not sufficient to exclude this. But I think for the time being, uh, the mutations that we have discovered so far uh, are really all uh, um, probably where well, the vaccines really protect from all uh, uh, mutations that we see to more or lesser extent. So for example, there, there's this uh, South African uh, mutation that may have a uh, okay, will be less efficiently uh, protected from by some several vaccines. And so the question is, how fast can we adopt, uh, adapt the vaccines to a rising mutation? And so that is something what probably puts some advantage on the mRNA vaccines because they can be adapted much faster than probably uh, the vector-based uh, or, or the protein-based uh, vaccines. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question to Dr. Delgado. I, I don't know this, uh, this name, but it is a question from the audience. Is GAM COVID vaccine under investigation for approval? I don't know what is it. They, I, I suppose they mean the Sputnik, the Russian vaccine? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, we have not. We have not received an application from from that developer yet. Uh, the EMA has been in contact with the manufacturer, and and that's the, that is publicly available because they've received scientific advice from the EMA. Uh, but we have not uh, received a, a proper application. And and the moment the EMA receives it, it will be published immediately. In the in the website, uh, as I said, whenever a rolling review starts, this is made publicly available. Thank you. Thank you. A, a question um, to Dr. Patel. Um, we've heard a number of times in this webinar that acute leukemia patients and leukemia patients generally are likely to suffer, um, have reduced efficacy with regards to the vaccine. We've had a question about what exactly we mean by reduced efficacy. Do we mean patients are more likely to contract COVID or do we think they're more likely at risk of severe illness even when they've had a vaccine? Thank you, um, Zach. I, I think I, it is important to try and clarify what, what that um, term means. Um, we, the first starting point is we don't have any information about how um, the vaccine is beneficial or not in terms of anti um, SARS CoV 2 immunity in any of the patients um, mentioned. The, the, the information that we uh, use is extrapolated from other vaccines, so for example, pneumococcal vaccine or influenza vaccine, uh, where we know that even extremely compromised, immune compromised patients can develop an immune response. In some patients, it's a similar immune response to those patients in the general population who we don't think have any immune um, paresis. But um, generally, we find that the immune immunity in terms of antibody measurement, which is the usual way it's measured, antibody levels, are slightly lower um, in those patients who are immune compromised 
compared to the general population. That's the, the, there aren't really um, uh, lots of data sets, even for non-COVID vaccines, in that regard. The, you know, there are some, and, and um, Professor uh, Sibilista mentioned some of those in her talk. Um, but what that the the worry about well, what does it mean? Does it mean I'm going to um, if I'm a patient, am I going to get a uh, severe infection? Am I going to uh, be hospitalized? Or as uh, the aim for the vaccines is, is it going to provide enough protection so that only mild infection occurs? We, we don't know is, 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 the, um, is, is the place we're at, at the moment. But if we were to speculate, we would, we would expect that most patients will get some protection and that protection would manifest as reduced uh, intensive care unit and reduced hospital sort of uh, admissions in terms of severity of COVID. Okay, uh, I see some question to uh, Professor Simbalista, uh, all uh, all focusing on the the well the time the ideal time where the patient should be uh, vaccinated is it before the treatment is it after the treatment um, well uh, could you could you precise uh, this uh, this uh, well schedule ideal schedule so to say um okay well i think we can't always choose uh so um i think it's there is a choice uh to postpone the, the initiation of a treatment uh it should be done uh, because in CLL, not all treatment are uh, emergencies. So uh, if you can uh, decide to vaccinate the patient and then start the, the, the treatment after uh, the second dose, I think it's probably better. Um, patients who are on treatment are likely to have a reduced uh, a response to vaccine, but we have no choice. So uh, once they are on treatment, I don't think that there is a specific time. They should be vaccinated at any time. And uh, for the patients uh, who have uh, received treatment before, I mean, uh, it's the same. They, they can be vaccinated at uh, any time, the earliest, the, the better. Thank you. Zach, any any further question? Well, we have uh, we have lots and lots of questions <laughs> yes. um, that we've we not been able time to get for two to. Two or three of them, huh? not more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think just we have pages and pages of questions coming in, so it's great to see the engagement from everybody on the topic. Um, and I should also take this time to thank all of our speakers for joining us. Um, lots of difficult questions, and apologies for throwing them all um, at you. But I think we'll end with a final question um, to kind of really summarize and, and maybe get everybody to comment on this question. Um, if, if you were talking to a leukemia patient with either CLL or acute leukemia and you were trying to convince them to have the vaccine, what would be your overwhelming message? Um, so Professor Simblista, maybe you can go first. And what do I say to a patient who says, I don't want to be vaccinated? Is, is that the question? Yeah, I mean, maybe someone who's unclear, unsure as to why they should have it. How would you summarize the benefits to them? I think that uh, I, I try to convince, that, to convince them by explaining the way it works. I think that uh, I'm, I'm a true, great believer of uh, uh, pathophysiology. Uh, so I think that explaining how it works sometimes and, and showing that myself, I got the vaccine uh, is a good way to convince them. Uh, right now, uh, I had very, very few refusal. And uh, I think that uh, my final uh, uh, argument is that uh, it's better to have a reduced efficacy than no efficacy at all. And uh, very often the, the last argument is that they will be able to see their grandchildren uh, more often and uh, with uh, less uh, uh, difficulty. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, actually. I, I think um, I can't think of any patient who has not uh, been vaccinated um, that's been offered one. Um, I think that the, the vaccine does provide an opportunity to at least prevent um, death from severe disease and hospitalisation. Um, 
and uh, although there's uncertainty about the, the numbers in terms of the available data, uh, I think it's clear that the vaccines are safe and therefore uh, it's something that we would recommend. And I have to say that there's been very little uh, pushback that I've seen from, from patients and, and like um, Professor um, Symbolista, you know, we've all been vaccinated, I, I, you know, including, including um, uh, myself, colleagues uh, working in the hospital. And I think most of, well, not, not, most of the older population in, in the UK has also been vaccinated. So it's, it is, you know, I, I think it's, it's much less of an issue than perhaps historically uh, vaccines have, you know, have, have had in terms of challenge and pushback. Uh, Dr. Delgado? Um, well, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not practicing medicine right now, uh, and and I wish I could show them a badge like Professor Simbalista has, but unfortunately, since I'm not having contact with patients, I haven't been vaccinated yet. But I envy her for for her vaccine. Uh, I will focus on safety. I will focus on safety. Uh, all the vaccines that are approved are are safe in, in immunocompromised patients. And, and we tend to have these conversations with patients all the time for the flu vaccine. There, there are lots of, this, this happens all the time. So this is not a new conversation for, for hematologists actually. Thank you. And the last word to Professor Liber. Yeah, well, the, quest, uh, the, the answer is uh, very easy and uh, has been uh, said already before. The vaccines are safe to get vaccinated is better than to stay unvaccinated. And if I had a choice or friends of mine in my age group, I would say, get vaccinated. This is important and be happy that you could get the offer of being vaccinated. Thank you, uh, Professor Liebert. It's a, a fine conclusion to my point of view. Uh, I thank you very much to all the speakers, to, to the audience that asked a lot of questions. And uh, uh, let's say, uh, well, uh, the, 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 the conclusion has been, has been yet uh, established, get vaccinated, recommend vaccination. And uh, we are far from being at the end of this story. And I guess we will have the opportunity to organize another seminar, webinar, uh, as soon as possible, as, as, or, or better, better said, as soon as we get uh, some more information about those uh, sensitive questions and uh, very interesting questions. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you from me as well to everyone for joining. Nice to see you all and see you again in the future. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.